As all of you can see, I'm twice the man my son is. <laughs> and I'm not proud of that. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne. Well, this, this is a great day. I don't know of anything that could be, that any father could have as a greater privilege or a greater gift on Father's Day than to preach in the church where his son is the pastor. That's a great, tremendous gift. And when Wayne asked, when Wayne asked several, uh, several months ago if we would be a able to do that, we said that we would certainly make the arrangements and we looked forward to doing it. Uh, and it is Father's Day and I I'm sure you fellas are looking forward to getting to that restaurant or barbecue or someplace that you have planned. So I have a couple of promises for you today. I promise I will not be real long. I promise I will not preach a Whopper Pastor Wayne sermon. And I promise I will not preach a Marathon Pastor Micah sermon. Yeah, I go online and listen to these every once in a while. <laughs> but I do want to, want to you know, be able to promise that uh, what I have to bring and what I have to share will be of the Lord and from the Lord. And we pray that his, his anointing will be on this message today. <sighs> Father's Day. You know, some people have said, well, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day. No, it's not. I heard someone recently say that... Uh, well, Father's Day is just like Mother's Day, except the gifts are a whole lot cheaper. <laughs> and then I uh, also, you know, predating a lot of our texting and, you know, and cell phone stuff like this, when you used to have to use landlines, it, it, it was very, you know, it was a very, very easy thing to track that on Mother's Day, the most long-distance phone calls were made. On Father's Day the most collect calls were made. <laughs> so we fall a little bit short there once again. But uh, it is a great day, and I, I, I want to send, give my congratulations too to all of the dads and all the fathers that are here today. Uh, on this Father's Day, we've had the privilege already of having a young lady stand up here on this platform and sing for us. What is she? God's girl. That was terrific, wasn't it? Boy, she sang that song so well, and she is a God's girl. And so if we can have a God's girl, I hope to put on this platform a God's father, a Godfather as well. Now, uh, there, there were a series of, I, I don't, what were they, TV programs or movies that were out a, a while back, years ago, called The Godfather. Is that correct? The Godfather. Now, I never saw any of them. Uh, but I've heard about some of them, and uh, I, I thought, well, I, don't, I, I think all I've heard about them is it's, it's a bunch of violence, and it's a, about this bad individual that is the godfather in charge of everything, uh, that, that that godfather depicted in those movies is one who decides if somebody lives or dies. That godfather is the one who, uh, I, I think one of the most famous lines from that is what? I'll make you an offer you cannot refuse. Does that come from that? Something like that. Uh, yeah, I'll make you an offer you cannot refuse. But it was about violence. It was about destruction. It was about dysfunctional families and crime and behind the scenes. All things that, that could be wrong were depicted there in a movie called Godfather. Well, I think it's time for another sequel to this. Godfather 14. I don't know how many Godfathers there were, but Godfather 14 for Godfather 2014 because I believe that today we need more fathers that are under God's authority and more fathers that are going to act like God is in their life rather than the type of Godfather that was presented in those movies and that were depicted on those scenes. We can go to the Bible and find, of course, many places, many good examples of, of uh, men that really stood out as a, as a, as a Godfather, like a Godgirl, a Godfather, and, uh, but I want to take us to a place in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 8, for this Godfather. And this Godfather, his name is Jairus. You can turn uh, to those scriptures there. Follow along now as I read in Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to begin at verse 40 to 42. Then we skip over some verses and we'll pick it up back again at verse 49. 
So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitude thronged him. Now skip over to verse 49. Uh, by the way, you know, if you're reading normally, you wouldn't skip over because you'll find that uh, Jesus is continuing to minister to the lives of the people wherever he is, wherever around. And in, in that little segment there, he is healing the woman with the issue of blood. But we pick it up at verse 49 after he's done that. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside and took her by the hand and called, saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. This is indeed an amazing, awesome story again about the love of Jesus, the power of God. We cannot possibly put any restrictions on the power of God. His power is limitless, and it is a fact an absolute fact today that the same God, the same Jesus, with that power is the same Jesus today and has the same power today. That's my God. That's the one that I serve. And I say that is a fact. I mentioned to Marge the other day how I had heard someone on, a, on an early morning radio talk show and they were talking about, uh, somebody had called in and they were talking about to some seminar they went to at one time and they went to this seminar it wasn't a christian seminar it was a secular one but uh she said she didn't remember who the speaker was but he he said something about about facts and uh, you know that a fact is a fact and you can't change a fact how many believe the, the word of god is a fact uh, is, a, is the truth you know truth is the truth and he gave the little illustration she said that uh, uh take take any any rainy day whenever it is raining outside you're going to have a farmer that is rejoicing, unless he just cut the hay. And he's going to be rejoicing for that rain replenishing the ground. You're going to have a, a group of schoolyard kids complaining because they can't go out to recess. You're going to have moms uh, upset because they, they can't go on that uh, yard sale shopping spree if the rain is coming down. And yet you'll have others that are rejoicing because the rain is coming down. But he said, of all the things, is you have a lot, of, a lot of attitudes towards the rain. You have a lot of things and feelings about the rain. And he said, and those can change from every different person. But the one thing that is a fact, the one thing that is truth and is a fact and is remains that it is raining. That's the truth. It is raining. That's the fact that, that it can't be changed, regardless of how you feel about it. And I believe God's word is a fact. God's word is truth. And whether you believe it or not, it's the truth. And whether the world believes it or not, it's a fact of what has taken place. And we need men today and we need fathers today that are willing to stand on that fact and that truth and are going to be God fathers in the year of 2014. So we look as an example here to this uh, man called Jairus. And uh, in, this, in, this, in this event that took place in the life of Christ, oftentimes it is preached from, the, from our pulpits, you know, and, and the emphasis is on the Lord. 
And the emphasis is on the Lord and his miracle-working power. As I said, it shows uh, even when he was on his way, he cared for other people. He's always, he's always there. The Lord is always there, always wanting to help, always wanting to bless. And it focused on that. We can focus then on, on the girl. This young girl was 12 years old. We can focus on her and what took place in her life. Boy, did she have a story to tell when she got back to school. What had happened to her life. And so we can focus on her being dead, coming back to life, raised to life again. We sang about the one who has raised to life. We worship the one who has raised to life today. And this girl had that testimony also. He brought her back to life. But today, I want to focus on her father. Her father, whose name is Jairus. And what kind of a man was he? Well, again, he was a man who, uh, it says, was a ruler of the synagogue. Ah, I guess that would be something like a pastor, <laughs> right? Uh, a ruler of the synagogue. He was, he was a man who was in charge of, of spiritual things. He was in charge. But listen, e even then, you know, we, sometimes we think of the pastor, you know, is just in charge of spiritual things, and all the pastor does is, you know, pray and read the Bible and, and heal the sick and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, we pastors, we do a lot more than that. I always said in Bible college, you know, I, I remember, I remember they had a, a, a survey when I graduated from Bible college for all of us departing seniors as we were going out. And the survey said, what, what class do you think that we should incorporate into the curriculum? And I said, chair folding 101. <laughs> Uh, chair carrying, table carrying, 101. That's because you're going to do more of that than almost anything else when you're first getting started in the ministry. Another thing I said about was accounting, you know, and have good bookkeeping and accounting things because you end up doing a lot of that and, and, and doing all sorts of things like that. And this young girl, Jairus' daughter, we don't have her name. We don't have her name. She's just Jairus' daughter, and she's 12 years old. That's what we know about her, plus the fact that she, she had died. She was very sick, and then she died. But Jairus, we have the father's name, and so it, we, we should focus on this man whose name is, is given right here. And as a ruler of the synagogue, he, he would do his daily chores. He would be in there. Now, you know, she, she saw him working. She saw him being faithful. And a, a leader, a ruler of the synagogue, had to be a religious person. Now, religion is not, sometimes we say, you know, religion, we use that word religion. I, I'm not religious. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just a Christian. But religious is not a bad word. Religious means you faithfully do something. And so he was religious and faithfully performing his duties in, in the house of the Lord. And as this faithful, his daughter could see him every day, going about that, doing these chores and, and overseeing everything that was there. And as he would oversee the things, he would have to definitely take care and keep charge of the things that were there. Now, as she saw him overseeing these things day to day, I, I, she probably was like many other 12-year-old daughters, and they, they look and they observe their, their parents and they observe their father, and they think uh, that's just a bunch of silly, nonsense, foolish, old people things that they do. Doesn't, doesn't affect me, doesn't affect my life at all. But I tell you, if you are a God father, what you do will affect your family, will affect your children, will affect the lives of those who come after you. And so she observed these things, of course, as he was there. But I want to give you just three main things that what she saw in her dad that I want to see, I want to find, I want to discover in every man that is here today the same things. The first thing she saw a dad who was not ashamed to seek Jesus. A dad who was not ashamed to seek Jesus. When his daughter became sick, and I, this is, see, this is, a, this is a terrible thing for any father to see a child that is sick. You mothers hate it too. And dads hate it too. You see, mo mothers don't like it, but mothers seem to go into action right away. Your mothers go into that action. That mothers become that, 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 that nurse, that, 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 that healer, that helper. They, the, the mothers are the ones that have been on the Internet finding the cures for everything right away. You know, Us dads, we just feel helpless. What do I do now? Well, this, this young girl saw in her father when she was sick, when she was at that point where he was hurting for her, she saw that he, 
being a ruler of the synagogue, was not ashamed to go seek help and praise God. He knew where to look for that help. He was seeking the help of Jesus and was not ashamed of it. I'm sure that there were others who, who, who looked at him and, and, and may have asked, well, where are you going? You should stay home with your sick daughter. You should be here by her side. You should be there praying for her. Where are you going? And he says, I'm going to look for Jesus. This father knew he needed Jesus in his life. He knew he needed Jesus for the well-being of his daughter who was sick on that day. And so he was not ashamed. He was not ashamed. And he must have assigned some, you know, one of the other leaders of the synagogue to take care of the duties and responsibilities while he was gone. But he surely gave his daughter a life lesson there. When you have a need, and it is a great need in your life, the best thing you can do is go and find Jesus. So unashamed, he goes. The Bible says there in that verse, there came a man. So he went. He was a man, and he went. He's that one that's talking about. There came a man to Jesus, and Jesus was doing what he's always doing. Jesus was ministering to many people. And Jesus was concerned about all those people. And I, I, it's, it always amazes, amazes me that right now, while we sit here in, in, this, in this beautiful uh, place of, of worship and community and fellowship, that at the same time, all around this globe, there, there are congregations that are meeting. It amazes me. And, and as God is concerned for them and he's concerned for us, he hears what we say, he sees what we do, he receives our worship like he's receiving from the multitudes all around the world, and he is just waiting for somebody to come and seek him and to find him. It has been difficult for men. It has been difficult for men sometimes to, to say that they need to look for Jesus. Marge knows. I never have to ask directions. <laughs> right, Marge? Yeah. I never have to ask directions. She knows that at Christmas time, I, I never have to look at the, you know, the instructions how to put something together. I can do this. I've got this. That's the way men are, Right? We can do it. We don't need help. We are self-sufficient. After all, I'm a man. But a real man, a real God father, one who wants to give God to his family and to his children, knows that there are some things he cannot do, and he might as well give up in the beginning and go seek and find the help of Jesus. And don't be so ashamed that somebody's going to think, well, you're weak because you're seeking Jesus. You're stupid because you're seeking Jesus. Didn't you learn anything? Didn't your father raise you to know anything? You've got to go look for help outside from somewhere. This one called Jesus. Jairus didn't care. He was not going to be embarrassed by showing his weakness. Because we are all weak, aren't we? And he then went. And so his daughter learned that. Saw it from him. Notice he went. He didn't send his wife. Right? He didn't send his wife. He didn't send, send her. He, he, he didn't send a servant. He could have done that as a ruler of the synagogue, having a number of servants that could have helped. He didn't send a servant. He didn't send his wife. You getting some of the relationships here? Because some men only send their wives and children to church to look for Jesus. And then hopefully, when he needs Jesus... They'll have a little left over, running over. Somehow it's going to touch his life. It's backwards. That's so backwards. Men, you should be the one that will seek Jesus and go look for him and find him in your life. If our dads, if more dads would start seeking Jesus without shame, how many think that's going to change the world? And it's not going to take a long time to change the world if more men were doing that. You know, I pray for your pastor because I know him well. And I do pray, and every day when I pray for your pastor, who is my son, 
I pray and say, Lord, anoint him to be the priest of his house. And then I pray, Lord, anoint him to be the shepherd of the flock at New Life. And then I pray, Lord, anoint him to be the prophet in the community and to reach out. That's what I pray for you, Wayne. Because you need that anointing for all those things. But notice what I put first. Anointing to be the priest of the household. There could be nothing more important for a man to do than to lead the way to Jesus for his family. And I honor and bless all you dads that are here today leading the way for your family. You've come here today to seek Jesus. You have come as Jairus did to seek the one that has the most to offer. Some dads are you know, are teaching their children how to, how to seek golf balls. Some are teaching their sons how to, how to hit home runs. Now, I tried. I, it didn't work. When I tried to teach Wayne how to hit home runs. <laughs> but, you know, we, we try. We tried all that stuff. But some of the same fathers that will do anything to teach their sons how to hit home runs have never made any attempt to teach them how to get home to heaven. How to get first, second, third, fourth base home to heaven. That is much more important than hitting a home run on the playground in the sand lot. Many fathers have taught their sons how to, how to pass a football, but never, never considered teaching them how to pass on the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ. Some fathers have taught them how to, how to make, a, a, make a, a beautiful three-pointer to win the game from outside the ark, but have never, never told them how important it was to be inside the ark of God's safety. Dads, we, we, we want... We want the best for our children. We want the best for our sons. We want them to be, you know, athletically good and sharp. Uh, 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 hunting as well. You know, we, we teach our children to go out and find that trophy buck. But fail to tell them about the prize of the high calling there is in Christ Jesus. Dads, we need to put the first things first. And the first thing for you and I as a dad is to seek Jesus. And don't be ashamed when we go and look for Jesus. We need to find him. So that's the first thing. That Jairus' daughter would have known about her father. He wasn't ashamed to go look for Jesus. The second thing, she saw a dad who was not ashamed to bring Jesus home. Think about that for a minute. A dad who was not ashamed to bring Jesus home. To let the word of God, Jesus' presence, do not only be known in the home by, by, by him or by a few of the family members, but by anybody who would ever come into that home, they're going to sense the presence of Jesus there. This young girl saw that, that there, was a, there was a dad. She had a dad that not only went to seek for Jesus, was not ashamed to bring Jesus home. I sort of get a chuckle out of a little bit of that part there when, where it talks about when, when Jairus was there and, and the whole crowd was there and one of, one of the uh, servants of Jairus came and said to him about, you know, well, you don't, have to bother the, you don't have to bother the master any longer because your daughter is dead. Your daughter has died. Oh, my, think of that. Wayne emotionally thought of how, how terrible it would be if, it, if her daughter got caught up in that traffic and, or something like that. And, and then what it, like some of you have experienced the loss of a child in your life. How devastating, how, how, what a kick in the stomach and take your breath away type of thing that would be. Well, the message came to Jairus out there that uh, you don't have to bother the master anymore because she's already died. And to, to most, that would have just put an end 
It would have put an end to his journey. It would have put an end to his hope. It would have put an end to his faith as he, as he was so close to getting Jesus to do something to help. But she's already died now. But <laughs> what she saw in her father was his unending faith. What she saw in his father was his hope that went beyond all hope. What she saw in her father was one that when it was announced that she was dead, still said you know, to, you know, to the Lord to, to come on. And the Lord said, you know, let, let's keep going. Let, let's go on here. Can you get the phone? If, it, if there were phones, there would, there would have been a phone call. Honey, uh, I'm coming home now. Yeah, get the place ready. It's uh, yeah, me, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is coming. I, I, know, I know what they said, but, but we're coming. Oh, 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 there's, there's a... There's about two or three hundred others that will be joining us for dinner today. Because the whole, you know, the, the whole group, the whole group went along. As a matter of when they got to the house, what does it tell us? It says that they, they made her stay out. Jesus made the rest of the crowd, the multitude, stay outside for this particular event for a number of different reasons. We won't go into all the different reasons that there may have been now. But the, the crowd was still going there to the house and following. But, but here, here's Jairus. He's, he's not going to be... He's not going to be ashamed to have Jesus come to his house. And, you know, at, at that time, again, the rulers of the synagogue, a lot of, them, a lot of them weren't even supposed to mention the name of Jesus, right? They, they didn't want to you know, be associated with Jesus. They were radicals if they mentioned about Jesus at the synagogue and, and in, in, in this synagogue, this rabbi's house, to bring him there. Unashamedly, he brought them there. You see, he was a God father. Example. And God fathers, true God fathers, are going to say, I want more of Jesus in my house. I want you here more often. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, true God fathers are going to pray. Pray to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be in this house today and I want you to monitor the internet and I want you to monitor the TV. I want you to monitor all the devices. I, I want you to monitor what, and, and, and put blinders on my, on my children's eyes when Satan wants to tempt them so strongly today. Jesus, I want you there to help them. I want you there to do that, Jesus. Not a shame to invite Jesus into our homes and into our life. It, it is so important. Man, not a shame to, for you to go ahead and lead the prayer at your house. For you to go ahead instead of always relegating, maybe at mealtime, the prayer to the children. I mean, how many, how many times can you listen to, dear Lord, if you're looking in the crack, please bless this little snack? Let Dad say something a little bit uh, more relevant, more mature sometimes, praying around the table. And that which is normally done or you relegate to the children. I said all those children's prayers. My, my parents taught me to say those prayers. God is great. God is good. Bless you for this daily food. Amen. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before, I know you've heard that before. If I should die before, isn't that terrible? What a way to put a kid to bed with confidence. <laughs> I've got confidence, but you better pray if I die tonight. Those are okay to teach our children. But what if they hear dad pray? And my father, uh, I, I always, you know, he had a set time every night that he, he left the living room and went downstairs into the basement where his little desk set up and the Bible on. He, he's not a, he wasn't a pastor. He was just a godfather. Father that loved God and led his fa family to the Lord. A set time where he would go, and we knew where Dad was, and we knew what he was doing, and we knew that he was praying for us. Now, in this period of life, Marge and I have the privilege of having him live in our home. It was his home that he was always in, but we were able to, to purchase the home, and so he could stay there because his failing health. There's no one who would have enjoyed being here more today than, than my dad. Right? You know that way. Pop Pop would have loved to have been here too. But no longer physically able to do that. No longer physically able to make it up and down the steps. I had to go to that, that special like, prayer closet that he had. 
And so, you know what? I have made it a point every night, if I'm, if I'm home, every night at 8 o'clock is his time he, he gets ready to go to bed. And I go in with him, help him, help him to do whatever he needs to do to get ready to sleep. And I take Dad's hand and, and we pray together. We pray. And most of our praying is thanking God. Praising the Lord for what he has done and, and how he's helped us as a family. And then praying for the things that we need to we are still, I have the privilege in that same house to continue to invite Jesus to be there. As my dad has done for 80, well, he's 87 years old, but all of his adult life, he prayed that Jesus would come and be there at 14 Laird Street. Dads, are you praying that the Lord comes every day to your house at your address and your family? Jairus' daughter would learn that her dad was not ashamed to bring Jesus into the house. How can we bring Jesus in the house today? I said through prayer, through intercession, through God's word. Bring God's word into your house. You're bringing Jesus into your house when you bring God's word into the house. And so it was that she could see these things. And then the third thing, she saw a dad who was not Ashamed to put the welfare of his child in his hands. Dads, it's hard to let go, isn't it? It sort of goes back to that same feeling. I've got this. I can handle this. I, I, you know, I, I can guide my son and my daughter. I can tell. I know where my, I know, I know where my daughter should be going to school. I know where my, what, what field of employment and vocation my son should be going in. I know. I've been their dad, and I, I've trained them. I've guided them. I've prepared them, and I know what direction that they should go into. That might not be what God's will is for your son and daughter. We need to be willing to without any reservation, put our children in God's hands. Why? My hands get weak. My hands get tired. My hands are small. I, I do have little hands. You know. I don't have a very big, you know. I'm short, what can I say? I'm a little short German guy. I'm deep and wide. But my fingers are short, you know, and, and, and so I can't, I can never grip a football real good to be a thrower, so I was a lineman in school, in, in high school, I was a lineman, you know, they didn't trust me holding the ball in my hands, so I did the best that I could, but I long ago found my hands are, are very weak, what about the hands of God? Remember that old, some of you have no idea, but it was an old song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Hey, fact. That's a fact. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's not just some fanciful song. That is a fact. And he made the whole world, and he holds this whole universe in his hands. Those are some big, whopping hands he has. If his hands are big enough to hold the whole universe, there's room for my son, there's room for my, my daughters in, in his hands, there's room for your sons and daughters in his hands. And his hands will do a much better thing than you will. But it's hard to release. It's hard to let go. And sometimes, it's, you know, again, it's, it's not just the voice of a parent that wants to guide and direct and thinks that we know, we know the course there should be. But sometimes there's even other people that, that are giving wrong signals and, not, and tra hindering you from being in the hands of God. Uh, Robert Morris, he had, he had most recently pastored and passed away now, but he most recently pastored at Harrisburg First Assembly. But let me tell you a little bit something about Robert Morris. And I didn't know all of the, I knew him uh, for many years, but I didn't know all these things until his funeral service uh, a couple of years ago. But Robert Morris, he, uh, just a marvelous man. He, uh, he was, I first met him when I was in Bible college at, it used to be Eastern Northeast Bible Institute. And he was one of the professors there. And I liked him I, just by his presence on the campus. I never got into one of his classes. But uh, because he, he gave up his position as being professor and went to Lancaster First Assembly of God. And he pastored there for 28 years. 
Then he went to Harrisburg First Assembly of God and pastored there 25 years. Marvelous, marvelous man of God. He had also been a, uh, uh, he taught at Southeast Bible, Southeastern Bible College, and then he taught at, at, which is now Valley Forge Bible College. He pastored those churches. The same, he also did two tours of duty in the armed forces. He was at one time in the army, and then he was in the navy at another time. And he was, he was as short as I am. He might have been a little short. I, I think I looked down a little bit when I look at him. But very frail, not, 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 a, not a big structured guy either, very frail. But oh, when he talked, and when he, pre- he taught the word of God, it, it was just beautiful, it was wonderful. And at his funeral, I never knew this. At his funeral, the story was related, that had been passed down through the years. He was from the hills of West Virginia. And uh, one day there was a, as a, and he was a real young man there, and there was an evangelist that was, that was there and preaching, and they were having revival in the church, and he felt the call of God on his life. And he knew it. And after the service, he announced he was going to make his way down to Florida, the Southeast Bible, Southeastern Bible Institute. And people looked at him and shook their heads. And there was one man who was a very prominent man in the church. It wasn't his father, but another prominent man in the church. Because we have spiritual fathers in the church, you know. And that man looked at him, and he ridiculed him with his finger in his face and said, Son, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. You will never amount to anything in the ministry. But Pastor Morris knew better. (laughs) He knew better. He knew that if he put himself in God's hands, it was going to work out according to God's plan, not according to some man waving his finger in his face, not according to some dad doing that and saying, look, you'll never be anything if you go there. Could, could I just give you a little, little, little sidelight on, this has nothing to do with spirituality, but you know, some people just don't, don't get it. They have it. My, uh, some of my other grandchildren live in the eastern part of the state, and they go to a high school called North Penn High School. And... Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the celebrity graduates of North Penn High School is uh, John Oates of Holland Oates. They have, they, they have sold more records than the Beatles or anybody. They've, they've, they've sold more records than anybody, Holland Oates. And I hardly ever knew who they were. I mean, I heard the name, but I didn't know what they were. But recently I heard that when he was in, they had way back, way back, this is a long time ago, they had some contests, and he was in a contest with a band, and they sort of won a contest, so they got to go on a trip into a, like a next level of a contest, and he was in class, and one of his classmates related this story. They were in, they were in the math class, and the, the intercom rang, and it was a call for, for, for John Oates to, uh, you know, to leave. He, he got his permission to leave to go this, this next tryout for something. And his math teacher stood at the door and laughed in his face and said, young man, you might as well sit right back down in your seat because nothing's ever going to come of any of your music. And that's not spiritual, but that sure gives an insight into we do not know what is always best. But God knows what is best for my sons and daughters. God knows what is best. And so I need to be willing to put my children, as a godfather, I need to be willing to put my children in God's hands. We think we can pick the best school, again, the best educator, the, you know, the, to get them so much knowledge. And it, it, they'll do better if they get into this university, or they'll do better if they get into that university. They'll do better if they're mentored by this person. They'll do better if they go into this field uh, and venture in their life and something else. Only God knows what is best uh, for my family. And so as a God father, I need to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I relinquish them to you and in your hands. Jairus' daughter, she could look back over this whole situation and she could see in her father, that which I wish we could find in every father in America today. Not afraid, not ashamed to seek Jesus. Not ashamed to bring Jesus into our home and make him priority in our home. A lot of us have invited him in as what? As that, 
as that guest that we want him there when we want him there, right? We want him there when we want him there, but we don't want him there when we don't want him there. That's very profound, you understand. It took me a long time to write that one. But you know what I mean. We want Jesus when it's convenient. Godfathers want Jesus 24-7. Not only in their life, but in their house, in the lives of their children. They want him there. They want him there. So the, the question for us dads today is, you know, what are we doing? What, what, what kind of a godfather are you? Are you a godfather? Are you just another father in this world? What do your children, what do your children see in you? Uh, Wayne, I won't ask that publicly of you. We'll talk about this later. What do you see in me? We already know what Pastor Micah thinks of his dad's wisdom. I shudder to think what you think of mine. But we need to all personally, every father that's here today, we need to ask that question. What do my children see in me? Now, all of us could say, oh, oh uh, I hope he didn't see that. I hope he wasn't looking then. And we can say that of our, of our daughters too. I hope she didn't hear me say that. But listen, how many know you can't go back? We can't go back, can we? I, can, I cannot go back and redo the things that I did wrong that Wayne observed and that Wayne saw. I can't go back. Oh, how I wished I could. But I have a new day God has given me. Dads, we have this day to be a godfather. We have this day and, and every day, every minute of our breath that we have remaining, that we can make this determination. I want them to see I'm not ashamed of you. I want them to know I want you to be the priority in our home, in our house. I want them to know that I'm going to commit them into God's hands that are bigger and stronger than my hands. Yeah, that's, that's what I want. That's why I keep praying that way. Those things for you. And I, similar but different prayers for my other two children and our grandchildren. You know, we, we pray for our grandchildren as well as our children. We put them in God's hands. And that's what I am determined to leave with you in this message today. Romans chapter, chapter 1, verse 16 says what? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Would you all read this with me out loud? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Now, that's, there's a little more onto that verse, and I'm going to take some liberty to extrapolate from that, it follows right up with that and says, uh, not, not just to the Jews, but to the Greeks first. Or not just to the Greeks, to the Jews, whatever. And I'd like to say, you know, not just to our children, but to the dads first. Dads, we need to get this message. This needs to be our message and our understanding. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, for it is the what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To all the fathers here, to all the men who are maybe prospective fathers at some time, to young men that look forward to being married and having a family someday, I'm going to ask you, do you want to be a godfather? A godfather? If you want to be this kind of a godfather like Jairus was, I want you to stand up and come and join me right now down at this altar. Any man in here that wants to be a godfather, just come on down.
I did my best to wear a godfather outfit here today. Any man, any man, any young man looking to the future, you're saying, that's, that's what I want to be. I want to be an example like Jairus was. I want to be that example. I want them to see in me that I will, I will look for Jesus, go find him. I will search him out in the word. I will bring him into my house. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's a Godfather statement right there. We will serve the Lord. Why don't you just take your hands and hold them up to the Lord because like you're offering him something. You're offering him yourself. You're offering him your children. Heavenly Father, today I stand here in the front of these men with all gratefulness and thankfulness in my heart that you have given me the privilege of being a godfather, a father that has been able to show and direct my children to the Lord. I thank you, Lord. But the work is not over, not done. And today I, I still offer up to you my children, I offer up to you my grandchildren, and my, my grandchildren's children, when they come, I offer them up to you, Lord. I want them to be in your hands for you to do them to do your will, your way, in your time. And for you, O oh God, to put that, 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 that barrier, that hedge of protection around that has, no, it cannot be penetrated, cannot be broken through. The angels watch over them, Lord, and keep them safe. The, the Lord, have your spirit abiding in the, the blood, co blood covering of Jesus on them, O oh Lord. The blood covering of Jesus on my household at all times. Because nothing is stronger than the blood of Jesus. Your blood. That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. That's you, Jesus. And so here we stand. We are yours. Our families are yours. Our future is yours. <laughs> and we can truly say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because that's what every godfather would say. Thy will be done. Lord, I want you to remove, remove all the stains of the past. Remove, Lord, wash away all those mistakes that have been made. <laughs> Forgive us, O God, for we are sinners. And cleanse us and purify us and and let us start new today, like this is the first day of ever being introduced to you, and the first day of ever having opportunity to be the priest of our household, and to get it right for you, Jesus. Because it's so important. The legacy we live, not just the legacy we leave, the legacy we live, Lord. Every single day, we commit ourselves to you now. Would everyone in the congregation stand and reach your hands out towards these men right now? And I want you to begin to pray. I want you to vocalize your prayer. Just go ahead, everybody, as these men pray and seek God and reach up unto the Lord in their own personal way without anybody leading and directing your, their prayer. You lead out. You, you, you go ahead and pray, congregation. Pray for these men now. Oh, Lord Jesus, we are standing in this place and we are giving ourselves to you. Lord, we need your help. We need your power. We need that fresh oil every day. God, pour it upon us now that we will be the Godfathers of 2014. And if you give us 2015, we'll be the Godfathers then. And in the year after that, and the year after that, it doesn't matter, Lord, until you come, or until our days are over, we want to have that kind of a reputation. So we are a man of God, a Godfather. This is what we need, Lord, and this is what, this is what our world needs. Jesus, you know that. You know that is what we need in our world today. Men who are seeking after God. 
Well, the world shouts and screams at us, and Satan saddles up so close and says, but this is what you really need to get ahead. This is what your family really needs to get ahead. We can say to him, no, 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 I put them in God's hands. I've given them to the Lord. And Jesus Christ be praised. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen, we, 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 shouldn't, we cannot forget now, again, what happened to that little girl. Right? Because she had a godfather, Jairus. What happened to that little girl? And she was healed. Jesus said, don't be afraid now. Don't be afraid. When you're having the biggest challenge with your children, hear those words. He's still saying them. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. They, they may not be on the mark now, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I've got this. That's Jesus. <laughs> I've got this. Instead of me saying, no, Lord, I'd rather have it. No, no. Take it, Lord. Take it, Lord. Hallelujah. She was healed. Great rejoicing. Of all the people there, not everybody understood what was happening inside that house. But the godfather, Jairus, knew what was happening. Yeah. And he knew that it was all because of Jesus. And the 12-year-old daughter, she knew that it was all because of Jesus, but it was also because her dad went to Jesus. And I suspect that there are some of you dads here that have had your children already say, don't pray for me. You know, I, forget that. Don't. Don't, I don't need your prayers. I don't need your sermons. I don't need your speeches, Dad. I've heard it a thousand times. Forget that. Don't ever give up. Don't beat them into the ground with it, but keep putting them in God's hands. Here they are, Lord. Here they are. They, they, you know, they don't know what they're saying right now, but here they are, Lord. Your hands. You take them. Thy will be done. Praise the Lord. Wayne. Hallelujah.